welcome back. Today we will be unpacking some of the ideas we learned about in the first chapter when we talked about Hamlet, um, primarily external and internal events and kind of distinguishing the nuances between the two. Um, we'll be wrestling with Mother Courage and her children. Admittedly a pretty dark play. Um, I encouraged you to get the Tony Kushner translation but there are many great translations out there some of which are open resource so I'm sure some of you um, opted for the free one which I get totally understand. Part of the reason I'm interested in the Tony Kushner version is this um, documentary called Theater of War. Um, it's got Meryl Streep and Kevin Klein and famous playwright Tony Kushner. He wrote Angels in America which um, hopefully you're familiar with. If not, I encourage you to read it or watch it. It's on HBO as I record this, so um, I'd encourage you to watch it there. Um, he is um, an amazing playwright, and um, so getting to hear from him, George C. Wolfe is the director in the documentary uh, of the project. They're making video recordings of rehearsals of Mother Courage and her children that they're going to put on in Centennial Park and George C. Wolfe is a um, also a playwright but also a um, kind of a Broadway uh, legend so getting to talk and hear about their process and things is just an interesting nugget I wish it was available for streaming and I could require it for this class but of course I can't so if you can um, borrow it from me sometime I'd be happy to loan it to you so plot. Hopefully you understand that plot is just the story, right? Um, Aristotle says that plot is the most important thing. We're always waiting for the ending of the story. Um, obviously as I record this, the Avengers Endgame has just come out and uh, there's all this threat of spoilers. I saw my nephew the other day and he threatened to spoil it for me <laughs> uh, because we just understand that part of the reason that we are invested is in stories is to to know the ending. Um, my little twisted sense of humor, part of the reason I chose Brecht to talk about plot is that Brecht wrote a, rewrote a lot of the rules and he's written many books on um, you know dramaturgy and the theory of plot and the theory uh, he has directing theories that are very um, dense and well thought but part of kind of what he did is he would have someone come in with a banner and announce how the scene ends before people actually started watching the scene. Part of the reason that this, um, he justified it is he said, I really want people not to get caught up in the emotions. I don't want to emotionally manipulate people. Um, as you may know, hopefully uh, you know by now, Brecht was um, alive during World War II. He was German. His wife was Jewish. They escaped Germany. Um, and, and went to Poland and Sweden and uh, finally eventually came over to the United States uh, but he had you know been through the emotional manipulation thing and he wasn't a fan. Uh, instead he wanted people to think. He really wanted to incite thought and kind of shake people. Probably the most famous Brecht quote is um, art is not a mirror to be held up to nature but a hammer with which to smash it. Right, so he wants to shape um, people's minds. He is pretty clear about the fact that his plays are there to propagate an idea. They're there to influence people. So, um, I would pretty clearly put Mother Courage in the anti-war category. Um, you know, uh, Brecht was a communist. He went in front of the House of Un-American Activities Committees and said he wasn't a communist, but that was a bold-faced lie uh, that he he told to save his neck to be fair uh, so when we look at sort of um, what's going on we have Mother Courage played by Meryl Streep in the pictures I'll use today uh, her real name is Anna Fearling and she follows these armies around and she's a profiteer and um, but during that time we get to see the way that um, this war ravages the country and we talked last class uh, in chapter two um, about how a play can um, a playwright can choose a different era to write in 
um, rather than writing in their own time. And we can understand why Brecht wouldn't write about World War II as World War II is going on. Um, part of the same reason he lied to the House of Un-American Activities Committee, right? He's protecting himself um, by not directly pointing a finger into the face of a Nazi. Um, so he sets the play Mother Courage and her children during the Thirty Years War. So, and it was based off a famous vignette of this woman pulling her wagon, um, this famous um, piece of art of a woman pulling her wagon. So it's it's not unfounded the the setting for the time, but a, a lot of it is just about the futility and savageness of war. There's her wagon, very famous wagon there. So. As I've already spoiled it for you, <laughs> uh, the plot ends with three different deaths. Eilif, um, who is um, the person wearing the harness that's pulling the uh, wagon, you can see he's got that handle in his hand too, very strong, pulling the wagon. Uh, he gets recruited very early on in the play. Later in the play, he comes back and is resurfaces, and Mother Courage, um, he comes to say his last goodbye because he's going to be executed for a petty crime. And Mother Courage has an opportunity maybe to bargain for him in this war that they're in. It's very corrupt. Everybody can sort of be swindled. And she gets distracted, and he dies. Um, and she stands immobile. And it's uh, very clear in the stage directions that um, she is sort of, um, you know, stuck like a deer in the headlights. Swiss cheese <laughs> is there with hands over the ears. You can see just in these um, that Brecht had a sense of humor. This is this is dark. This is hopeless. It's but it does have moments of comedy, uh, such as her dumb son being nicknamed Swiss cheese. You know, it's got uh, holes in his head kind of thing and he gets enlisted as well but just as kind of the treasurer and but during a moment uh, he panics and runs away with the cash box in his hand and once again uh, they come to her and they're like you know trying to barter with her to save her son's life and she takes too long and after she hears the firing squad execute him she actually says the line out loud well that must have taken too long uh, Katrine, who is mute, is her daughter sitting behind her there with the pigtails, and um, we'll come back to her death uh, later in in my explanation of things, because it's really um, one of the more heartfelt moments of the play. As we can imagine, Brex trying to um, alienate his off. Uh, his audience. In fact, he actually calls it the alienation effect. If you're, um, if you've read any Marx, you know that he's borrowing that term from from Marx. But he's trying to alienate his audience the same way that that um, Bre Marx would say that working class people get alienated from their job and can no longer find uh, satisfaction in their job when it's when all of the rights and privileges go to the people above them. But so, so we're trying to keep people in their mind rather than swept up in the moment. And once again, my little twisted sense of humor. <laughs> the term I want you to know is exposition, but I have a um, a prostitute there exposing herself because it makes me laugh. <laughs> um, because the the word exposition comes from the term to expose a secret, right? To expose, and you read that in our textbook here. Um, exposition is often something that's hard for playwrights to write well. Um, it reveals something about the past while the action is still going on. And it can, um, poorly written, it can feel very cumbersome. Uh, poorly written, it, it can uh, slow down a scene, for example. Uh, Yvette has a great song here about the war. When I was only sixteen, the foe came into our land. He laid aside his saber, and with a smile he took my hand. After the May parade, the May light starts to fade. The regiment dressed by the right, the drums were beaten, that's the drill. The foe took us behind the hill and fraternized all night. There were so many foes then, but mine worked in the mess. I loathed him in the daytime. At night, I loved him nonetheless. After the May parade, the May light f starts to fade. The regiment dressed by the right, the drums were beaten. That's the drill. The foe took us behind the hill and fraternized all night. 
The love which came upon me was wished on me by fate. My friends could never grasp why I found it hard to share their hate. The fields were wet with dew, when sorrow first I knew, the regiment dressed by the right, the drums were beaten, that's the drill, and then the foe, my lover still, went marching out of sight. So we're reminded that war, uh, rape is used as a war tactic, right, and that she was abandoned by someone um, who was a soldier from the other side, which, of course, you would, in those situations, have to um, turn to whatever way you could support yourself, right? So Yvette is only a small part of the picture that I'm, so, uh, that I'm sure um, women uh, uh, are trying to tell their story. Um, and so sometimes exposition is that forthcoming, right? Like, like Yvette's song, like the prostitute's song, and saying, this is what happened to me and how I got to where I am now. Um, <laughs> so I have Star Wars there. I know, nerd alert, nerd alert. Uh, but um, the kind of preface we see in the Star Wars with the... Um, the long explanation of of getting us into the story that's very similar to what we would see in a Shakespeare play right um in that first scene that we saw in Hamlet um we had large um batches of exposition we have Horatio giving 29 lines explaining why uh, Denmark is preparing for war. We have Claudius giving 34 lines talking to the court about the transfer of power. So in in the first act, we have quite a bit of exposition, these long, lengthy speeches. Uh, we just closed Midsummer Night's Dream at Motlow, and um, I was um, in the play myself and had a two of those major monologues that sort of, um, you know, give the exposition, but they're important as an actor, they're intimidating as an actor, uh, and they're not necessarily, um, you don't always want to use tidbit, uh, if you are an actor, you don't always want to use one of those exposition heavy monologues as your, um, as your audition monologue. Because while it can show your skill to tell a story, often there's not a lot of emotion in telling a story. Right? You want to use those 11th hour pieces of monologues, those monologues cut from arguments, those monologues cut um, from, um, from po moments that are fraught with um, um, ideas rather than just telling the backstory, right? telling a story, because it doesn't really show off your acting chops, which is often why when an actor gets assigned a historical moment of exposition, they sort of ugh about it, right? Um, they were commonly used before the 19th century um, just to have somebody, you know, it can be the messenger, it could be a, a main character talking about someone before they come in, and um, it can be sometimes hard for the audience to follow, which is puts the onus on us as actors also to enliven our exposition monologues because if I am playing Titania and I'm supposed to show that this is a changeling child we're fighting over and the audience misses why I'm fighting uh, with my Oberon, then they don't understand the rest of the story, right? They get lost, they lose the plot, and then they don't enjoy the story. So they may keep, seem cumbersome, but they are important nonetheless. So um, we're kind of admitting that they can be tedious, but uh, act while you're part nonetheless. So more often, especially in modern plays, we have the retrospective method. And I'm going to read um, from Raisin in the Sun here the excerpt that's included in our textbook on page. Well, I'm not going to say the page because it's probably different for you. So when Walter and Ruth get up in the morning, Walter says, You want to know what I was thinking about in the bathroom this morning? No, <laughs> says Ruth. Walter, how come you always got to be so unpleasant, Ruth? Uh, what is there that to be pleasant about, Walter? 
you want to know what I was thinking about in the bathroom or not, Ruth? I know what you was thinking about. Walter, about how me and Willie Harris was talking about last night, Ruth. Willie Harris is a good-for-nothing loudmouth. Walter, anybody who talks to me got to be a good-for-nothing loudmouth, ain't he? And what you know about this is about... Oh, and what you know about who is just a good-for-nothing loudmouth. Charlie Atkins was a good-for-nothing loudmouth, too, wasn't he? He wanted me to go into dry clean business with him, and now he's grossing $100,000 a year. $100,000 a year. You can still call him a loudmouth? Ruth. Oh, Walter Lee. Walter. You tired, ain't you? Tired of everything. Me, the boy, the way we live, this beat-up whole everything. Ain't you? You tired, moaning and groaning all the time, but you wouldn't do nothing to help, would you? You wouldn't be on my side for nothing, would you? Ruth. Walter, please leave me alone. Walter. A man needs a woman to back him up. Walter. Uh, Mama, would you listen... Mama would listen to you. You know she would listen to you more than she would me and Benny. You think more of you, too. All you have to do is just sit down with her when you're drinking your coffee one morning and talking about the things like you do. Just sip your little coffee, see, and easy like you'd be thinking about that deal with Walter Lee is so interested in, about the store and all, and sip some more coffee like what you're saying isn't really that important to you. And next thing you know, she be listening good and asking you questions. And when I come home, I can tell her all the details and ain't no fly-by-night proposition, baby. I mean, we got it figured out, me and Willie and Bobo. Ruth frowns. Bobo. Walter. You see, this little liquor store we got in mind costs... 75000 and we figure the initial investment in the place be about 30000 see? And 10000 each. Of course, there's a couple hundred you got to pay so that you don't spend the rest of your life just waiting for them clowns to get your license approved. Ruth says, you mean a graft. Walter, don't call it that. See there, that just goes to show you that women understand about the world. Baby, don't nothing happen in this world unless you pay somebody off. Walter. Uh, Ruth, Walter, leave me alone. Each eggs are going to get cold. Walter, that's it. There you are. Men say to this woman, I got a dream. His woman say, each eggs. Man say, I got to take hold of this here world, baby. And woman will say, each eggs and go to work. Man say, I got to change my life. I'm choking to death, baby. And this woman say, your eggs is getting cold. Walter, that ain't none of your money. Walter. I was looking at in the mirror and thinking about it. I'm 35 years old. I've been married 11 years. I got a boy who sleeps in the living room. And all I got to give him is stories about people that live. And Ruth says, eat your eggs, Walter. Damn my eggs. Damn all the eggs that ever was. That's a really famous uh, line there. And so we get all of this, and thank you for bearing with me. I know that's a longer scene, but we get so much exposition from Hansberry, so expertly unrolled, right? Um, we learn that they have a son together, that he's sleeping in the living room. We learn exactly what Walter Lee's plans are. And you can tell that this is his little shtick that he says over and over again, and Ruth is exhausted to hear it, but people really do do this in real world situations. I know someone's probably asked you, what's your major? What do you want to do with your life? You probably have a little uh, rote answer maybe that you've worked out. And um, we, we have these sort of cornerstones that we go back to and uh, and recite. It's part of us defining ourselves, is defining our story. And we hear from Walter in an argument. So as an actor, we don't mind um, these sort of exposition heavy moments scattered through. Now Walter still has some pretty serious lengthy um, monologues here, but they're driven by his need to be understood by his wife which comes from a deep seed, right? And and that relationship and trying to sell her, it's something activated rather than someone just passively standing back and telling the story um, in a less invested way. I know, um, so hats off to Hansberry. She's a great example of using exposition well and sprinkling it in retrospectively. Now all of this is happening in the first scene but we find out all throughout Raisin in the Sun you know who um, Willie Senior was, who um, 
I'm sorry, I said Willie Sr. It's Walter Lee, Walter Sr. Uh, you know, that he cheated on Mama and that he um, was mean. You know, we find out things later in Raisin in the Sun. It's not like every single bit of exposition is stuck at the very beginning of the play. Um, but um, we get a good deal of exposition at the beginning of the play. Now, I kind of skipped over in your textbook talking about absurd plays and their lack of exposition, um, although I would challenge you when you come to a play like that, directing, acting, or otherwise, um, to be aware that it can be very um, off-putting to your audience not to get their bearings, not to feel like they understand the character that's speaking. Um, and I would argue to a certain extent as we go through Mother Courage that these characters um, have that same sort of absurd uh, blankness, right? Soldier number one, uh, cook, um, you know, priest. We don't, we see these people on a superficial level. Um, and I think it's great playwriting as an epic, as um, a step back to look in a more absurd or alienating way to tell a story. But every time, um, and I say this in humility myself, you think you, you got it worked out, you've got your, your method that you have of preparing a script, and then you'll come across a script that will blow up your method, <laughs> and it'll challenge you. And so if you come across an absurd play, I would challenge you to, to use the same methods that you're learning in this class to dig in and understand um, how to act that play. But for the sake of brevity, an intro-level course, we're not going to get into um, absurdity that much. So, external action. We talked about this when we talked about Hamlet, but now we have a full definition. External action are what the characters are seen doing on stage, right? This wagon is a metaphor for the weight of this, um, of her earthly possessions. This is all her earthly possessions. It could, you know, if we were in a reset, do a high version of Mother Courage and her children, it might be that she drives a tractor trailer or something, or a, or a, um, she's in a trailer park. Everything she has is in this wagon, right? Every bit of, of wealth uh, that she has. And so we can see throughout the play Mother Courage, and when she has her whole family there, um, them helping pull the cart, but towards the end when it's just the two of them, and then at the very end, the last thing that happens is she is still pulling that cart off stage, trying to follow these soldiers around. So in that way, we get to see that journey. Just as we follow Dorothy down the yellow brick road, we see Mother Courage pulling her wagon. And that physicalization of the, her journey, that story, um, is external action, right? Um, now, we know that Brecht was really interested in storytelling devices and that he had a lot of original ideas. He would um, show the mechanics of things working. He would insert songs or comic moments. Um, in the documentary, they talk about after the death of Katrine, one of the soldiers lays down on the ground and starts um, throwing a tantrum, which would always get a big laugh out of the audience. And that's to break that sympathy, to break that um, moment of of feeling too sympathetic for the characters in the play. So we know that Brecht is interested in the way that he um, probably notated these stage directions and was very involved in the first stagings of the play when his wife, Helena Weigel, was, um, all, was playing Mother Courage. But there are other playwrights who may not have included stage directions. And once again, just as we said um, last lecture, the stage directions may have just been recorded by the first stage manager. So we don't want to always take the stage directions every jot and tittle to be followed exactly, right? If you have a different playing space, if you have a different um, interpretation of the script, stage directions can be negotiable. And I would argue that you need to know your author well enough to know, okay, is this coming from my author or is it coming from the stage manager? So it can be kind of tricky, um, but 
following the sage directions, every jot and tittle is not necessarily necessary. And we as formalists are going to rely more heavily on the dialogue. And it can be that, you know, Shakespeare was really good about saying um, what light through yonder window breaks and, and giving us stage directions as actors. To, he was Part of it was just methodical that he didn't have a lot of time to stage his plays. And so when the actor says, I say on bended knee, that means they're supposed to, you know, squat down. So it was partially just um, his way of giving direction uh, to the actor. Uh, and, but if there is that in the, the dialogue, we want to make sure that's reflected on the stage. So, so we have her love interest here, the cook, and um, uh, that actor is just Kevin Klein, one of my favorites going way back. I used to watch Pirates of Penzance growing up, and he was the Pirate King. And recently that Beauty and the Beast live action came out and he was playing Maurice and I was like, what? My, uh, you know, my first crush, Kevin Klein, is now playing the old man. I can't believe it. Um, but the cook and Mother Courage speak very frankly to each other and, and joke about how his meat is old and joke. And, I, you know, having worked in a restaurant myself, you would never say something like that in front of the customer, right? And uh, every time that Mother Courage gets around a soldier or somebody, she starts selling. She gets into this mode of, um, of acting like she's not starving or desperate, which she is. Both of them are, especially by the end. Um, but we all behave differently depending on who's in the room, right? If I were giving this lecture in a live situation and the president, um, as I speak, it's Dr. Torrance at Motlow College, and if he were to come into the room, I would sit up a little straighter, right? If I had put my foot up on the desk, I'd take it down. <laughs> I would um, act a little differently, right? If my husband walked in the room, he also works at Motlow, and he walked in the room, right? I would react differently. Uh, maybe I would flirt with my husband a little bit, right? We, we engage in different people differently. And we're, a lot of us are aware of our audience, who we're speaking to, who we can be honest with, who we can't tell any given situation. So who or who is not is a, a big question for actors that you need to look at in script analysis before the staging of the play. Because how we let ourselves loose, how we behave, depends a lot on um, what we'll call the French scenes, who's on stage and who's not. All right. So another way, these are the three types of external action, is, is blocking, right? Blocking or the movement or location of characters on stage. And hopefully that is not a new term for you. Um, hopefully blocking is not a new term for you. Uh, but there is something he's calling indigenous blocking, and that just means it's ne necessary, right? Um, there's some blocking that's optional. If I have a little bit of um, leeway, say we're going to eat on stage and I'm eating the meal, a playwright's probably not going to dictate every time I pick up my glass and take a sip of wine. But there are those necessities to the story, right? We have those moments where we have to do a certain blocking in order to tell the story. So we want to pay special attention to the stage directions in those moments and make sure that the things that help tell the story don't get s skipped over. So props can be really useful in the way that we tell the story. Um, they create the physical reality, right? Those stage pictures. Um, a good director can often tell a story visually, even if we were to watch the play on mute and just watch the physical actions, then we would still be able to understand the story through those stage pictures, through those use of props and the way that they, um, the, the last moments of the play, you can see that, um, coin purse on Mother Courage's belt loop there in the last moments of the play. She pays to have Karina buried and she gets those little coins out of her little coin purse and it's just a desperately sad moment <coughs> and we get to see the care with which <coughs> excuse me tickle my throat I'm not trying to blow your ears out 
Um, we get to see the care with which she handles her purse and the desperation with which she gives up one of her final coins, which could lead to her death. Um, we all have um, rituals, things that we do in our daily life. Uh, I used to love to watch that show Monk. <laughs> um, he was OCD, and had all of these little rit rituals and the way that he would empower his props with meaning uh, was just hilarious to me. He's just such a great actor. Um, but we all have these kind of rituals, one that we see over and over again if we watch the documentary of, of um, For Mother Courage and Meryl Streep is this, um, you know, her sharing a drink with someone and they pay for the drink. She sits down and shares a drink with them. And that has a sort of a power to it. And the way that we handle our props, and Stanislavski calls that psychological gesture, you know, we can tell us a lot about a person and their inner life, right? The way that they um, handle the real world around them. So, so um, term number nine here, we have special activities. And he's kind of lumping that in with dancing, fighting, playing an instrument, right? And sorry for the grainy picture, but um, watching the lullaby, the um, moment that Meryl Streep sings as Mother Courage over the body of her dead child is just one of those tropes we see over and over again. And it is just heartbreaking, um, especially as it relates to war. Um, and the the problem is often that these dances or duels come at the 11th hour. They're one of the last things in the play. So if we're not careful, and I have been guilty of this myself, we stage the rest of the play, but by the time it gets to the end, we don't have time <laughs> to carefully stage an action sequence or a battle sequence that closes the show. Um, you know, you look at a play like Hamlet, we have that great... A duel and then other deaths at the end um, but if we don't take the time to actually make sure that those are structured and look good on stage they can fall flat so we have to be very careful there that they have emotional um, often we can use our voices we can use our instruments we can dance in a way that shows emotion maybe even better than just using our words and um, we appreciate those playwrights who write that into the story and um, they can often express things that words can sometimes limit us to. So we as um, theater makers really have to look at those big moments in the show and plan for those rather than letting them catch up with us and I say that as a person who's guilty. I just staged uh, Babes in Toyland and I even studied stage combat a lot in my grad school and it just got away from me and so we just kind of chased each other around the room and <laughs> Didn't, didn't end up having a great uh, combat sequence like I would have liked. Uh, but sometimes when, you know, time is the enemy of art, when, you, when you're trying to get through a process, you just, sometimes you run out of time. So uh, I would encourage you in your script analysis in the future, learn from my mistakes, carve out time early on for these special activities. Make sure they're done well, because what the audience will walk away talking about. So... So we talked about external action being those things to which you can ascribe something physical, but internal action are the mental, spiritual, and emotional lives, right? So the internal actions, like we covered in Hamlet there, are the internal lives that we have, the internal action. There are three different um, types of internal actions. We have assertions, plans, and commands. We see an assertion here between Mother Courage and her cook. She is telling him how it is, uh, boss lady. Um, and assertions can be this forceful or they can be just people speaking their truth, right? It doesn't have to be... Um, uh, doesn't have to be something larger. So I'm going to read just a little clip here from Swiss Cheese around his death. Um, so Swiss Cheese is 
saying, let me go, I haven't got anything, stop twisting my shoulder, I'm innocent, the sergeant says, he belongs here. You know each other. Mother Courage. What makes you think that? Swiss cheese. I don't know them. I don't even know who they are. I had a meal here. It cost me ten hellers. Maybe you saw me sitting here. It was too salty. The sergeant. Who are you, anyway? Mother Courage. We're respectable people. And it's true. He had a meal here. He said it was too salty. The sergeant. Are you trying to tell me that you don't know each other? Mother Courage. Why should I know him? I don't know anybody. I don't know... I don't ask people their names or if they're heartless, if they pay, they're not heathens, right? And so over and over again, we hear assertions in this section. They're um, claiming something and, uh, and affirming each other, right? give you an example of a plan from the next page. Mother Courage says, I'd better get the cash box out of here. I found a hiding place. All right, get me a drink. I'll hide it under the rabbit hole down by the river until I can take it away. Maybe late tonight, I'll go get it and take it into the reg regiment. So we can see the difference between an assertion and a plan, but all of these are things that can be hard to tangibly put our hands on, right? The moment that I knew I wanted to spend the rest of my life with my husband, the moment he proposed to me, the moment I accepted that proposition, right? If there wasn't an actual ring and he hadn't been on his knee, there wouldn't have been physical things to attach themselves to that moment. But it doesn't change the importance of that internal action and how it propelled our lives into the future. So we have those external events and those internal events. And I'll close today with um, Mother Courage here and her command, um, which is, like I said, probably my favorite moment in the script, much to the chagrin of, of uh, Bertolt Brecht. So Katrine is, um, it, like I said, this is the 11th hour, the 11th scene, and um, the regiment has come through and told them that um, to be quiet that they're they're going in to attack a town an unknowing town and the peasant's wife turns to Katrine remember she's mute and says pray poor creature pray we can stop this bloodshed so everyone starts praying and Katrine groans and she stands up and she sneaks off. Now she's mute, so people aren't expecting her to say anything. And this is a pretty harsh critique for Brecht on, on religious people and saying that they're expected not to have any action but to pray. And often what gets Brechtian characters killed is their goodwill, their good they're good traits you know we saw an Oedipus had a fatal flaw in his hubris um, but Brechtian's characters are living in corrupt worlds and they have some fatal virtue right and um, Katrine's fatal virtue was of course that um, her goodness and, and wanting to warn this town of sleeping people and while the peasant's wife is praying Katrine begins to beat the drum. She climbs up on top of the roof and begins to beat the drum. And um, she goes on drumming and uh, they warn her, the soldiers warn her, and um, she's shot and she falls off of the roof. And it's just one of those heartbreaking moments and I think it's particularly poignant and Mother Courage loses her last daughter and and it's the only one that she pays for a burial for um, because well and we don't know why and really in our twisted understanding of the play the the war is going to eat them all it's going to it's a hopeless situation and from Breck's pr point of view it's a hopeless situation um, but the command in this situation was coming from the peasant's wife and the peasant. They're pray, they're begging her to stop playing the drum, but she can't. Um, she can't not warn the village that this incoming army is coming, and um, we, that's when we get. After this moment is when we get the big lament from Anna from Mother Courage these large swings of emotion. Um, so 
so Brecht is is an extremist. He um, is living in an extreme time, and he is speaking out in an extreme way. And um, his works still resonate. They still rattle. They still challenge us. Um, and he challenges even the idea of what a plot is and how we're seeking the ending. Aristotle said that you know we sit down to listen to a story in order to find out the ending. But like we said, Brecht comes in with banners at the beginning of every scene and announces how the play's gonna, the scene's gonna end from from moment to moment because he wants us not to get lost up in the action or swept away in our emotion. He wants us to be vigilant in our minds and watch for the corruption and watch for th- these ugly worlds play out. Um, you know, Helena Weigel, they had a daughter together and she was saying of the script that, um, you know, there was criticism that came out. How could Mother Courage not see the corruption all around her? How could she go through so blindly? And um, Bertolt Brecht's reaction to that was, well, that's the audience's job, is to see that corruption and to see how war was tearing apart the countryside. And it's their responsibility um, to be enlightened. So um, I, I'm not trying to preach at you. I'm not saying that I believe in all of the things that um, the documentary exposed or in that Brecht endorses. I am, I can empathize with Brecht without accepting all of his ideas, and I hope you can as well. So thank you for listening.